All right, hello everyone. I'm Rachel Lowe from Physiopedia. Um, I'm talking today to Roz Owen. Hi, Roz. How are you? Hi. Good. Thank you. Roz. Um, Roz. I've met Roz through um, the preparations for our Clubfoot course that we're doing this year. Um, Roz is an executive director at GCI, and Roz has been helping us develop the course and has a really good um, grasp on the sort of global picture of Clubfoot. So we were hoping to talk to Roz. To you today about um, all the things you get involved in at GCI and the Afri Africa Club, Club Foot training, and then and then perhaps we can have a chat about what um, what you know and what you see as the sort of global picture of Club Club Foot, so that we can sort of share that with everyone who many of us work in our own small contexts and and don't have the opportunity to learn about what's going on elsewhere in the world. So it could be really nice to hear that from you because I know you have quite a good overview. But um, before we talk about all of that, maybe you could just introduce yourself to everybody. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you get up to at work. Okay. Um, as you said, I'm Executive Director of Global Club Foot Initiative. Um, so that involves all sorts of different things. Um, we're an umbrella organisation for uh, organisations working with children with club foot in low income countries um, and really our job is to help them communicate, coordinate their activities, um, make sure that efforts aren't duplicated um, and that where we can uh, we share things between us um, so that we're more efficient. So it's a it's a job I really enjoy um, and we've just launched our global strategy for club foot called Run Free 2030 um, and I'm sure I'll tell you more about that. Um, so that's that's what I do for Global Club Foot Initiative. Um, I'm also a physiotherapist working at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, um, and I work in a club foot clinic there, um, using the Ponsetti method to treat little babies with with club foot. Um, so I really enjoy that part of my job as well. Um, okay, so um, and I mentioned as well the Afri Africa Clubfoot training, which uh, we've been collaborating with you on and the team behind that in relation to building this course. So um, maybe tell us a little bit about that as well. Okay, yeah. So I mean, one of the, one of the things um, that's really needed in order to scale up treatment of clubfoot, especially in low income countries, is more human resources, more people that are trained to treat clubfoot, and. Um, we were finding that the training materials that we had available uh, a few years ago really were quite lacking um, and they weren't developed specifically for those contexts um, and they weren't developed in the style or specifically for the target group that we needed them to be. Um, so we're just coming to the end now of the Africa Clubfoot training project, which has been a huge two year effort um, of looking at the, the training materials that we had and then making them much more relevant to today's settings. So using adult learning techniques, helping people reflect on their own practice, um, using lots of interactive uh, workshops and things like that to help people really get to grips with the practical side of the treatment um, and then also making sure that everything's standardized and that's been a huge part of, of the work um, has been gaining consensus um, from the experts that we work with and our partner organizations um, to try and make sure that we're all saying the same thing um, because what we found in in training in the past was that sometimes different messages were given out and that that could be confusing. Um, so what we've developed is is three parts of the course. It's a there's a train the trainer part, um, which is used for building capacity within countries for countries to meet their own training needs. Um, and in the past, many of the countries that we work with, if they needed to do a training, they would always have to call an expert from outside the country. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant to see capacity for that being built up within countries. Um, then the next part of the, the training is the basic non-surgical club foot treatment course um, and that covers the treatment of a child with idiopathic club foot under two years old using the Ponsetti technique. And then finally um, the advanced 
uh, non-surgical club foot management course um, covers treating the more difficult cases like the older children, the relapses, the children with atypical and neurological club feet. Um, so yeah, it's been a huge effort. It's been really exciting. We've piloted it in uh, four different countries now. Um, we've trained trainers from 18 countries across Africa. Um, and every time we've piloted it, we've gotten huge amounts of feedback from the participants. And we've revised the course and refined it until it's something that we're really happy with. It's awesome. It sounds like such a great project and uh, such a, re a really nice collaboration of people from all over the world um, um, to produce something that everyone can share that's standardised for everyone across the world. And um, the courses that you talk about, so the courses you've developed, they're all in-person sort of face-to-face -face workshops, aren't they? Yes, they're all um, in-person workshops. Um, on the basic course we actually get people um, we have rubber legs that they can practice their casting techniques on um, we also have skeleton models um, because we found that people really need to understand the kinematics of the club foot and um, having those skeleton models in your hands uh, really helps with that um, and then we actually um, in the countries where we're able to we actually get hands-on treating babies under supervision as part of the course um, because the feedback we've had in the past is that people go home with all this great theoretical knowledge but they actually still don't know how to apply it on a baby so that's that's been a, a part of the course as well um, and I should just mention Rachel the the partners that we've developed that we've been working on acts with um, so it was led um, by Professor Chris Larvey at the University of Oxford um, and funded by the Department for International Development here in the UK um, and then Global Clubfoot and Cure International and Cure Ethiopia Children's Hospital were, were the partners. So we all worked together, but we brought in people from lots of other organisations as well. Yeah, a lovely collaboration um, and a really great effort. And we've been very fortunate to work with you, um, with ICRC and us phys at Physiopedia and working with you to um, use some of the content that you've developed to um, contribute to this course that we're running. So, so we'd, the purpose of this course, I think, is that we can s try and standardise sort of the theoretical knowledge that people can have um, before perhaps they go on a practical training skills. And although some of it will be repeated, it's very useful to do just do some reading around the topic beforehand. So Having done this course, if anyone, um, when you complete this course, um, the idea would be that um, you've seen a lot of the ACT materials or the knowledge that um, you guys have helped us to develop for this course. And then we don't teach practical skills on these courses. So the idea would be that if you can find a local ACT course, one of Ros's courses or something similar in your local um, sort of setting, then then you should be following up this course with a practical skills training course with some um people who can help you with the practical skills afterwards because we really can't teach you that. So so it's been really good to work with you and the content that um, the team um, have developed for the Af Africa Clubfoot training. And so this is, an, and it's a nice global team that you've been working with and you do seem to know everybody in the Clubfoot world. Um, <laughs> so, so you have- The small a, world. <laughs> yeah. So you have a really nice, I'm sure you have a really nice perspective of everything that's going on across the world. Could you um, just talk to us a little bit about how you see the sort of big global picture uh, and what's useful for people to know about that sort of thing? Yeah, sure. So um, I think anyone that, that knows about the Ponsetti technique will realise that in terms of um, medical techniques, it's a relatively new one. Um, it was developed in the 1960s by Dr. Ponsetti at the University of Iowa in the United States. And um, since then, it's, it's spread around the globe um, slowly at first and then more quickly in recent years um, to the point now where um, in higher income countries, it's, it's very well instituted and embedded within national health services and it's considered the gold standard of treatment um, for clubfoot. Um, 
it's been a bit slower to move into other regions of the world. Um, so the focus that we have is in low and middle income countries. Um, and we've been kind of monitoring progress in those countries since um, 2007, um, when there was there was a 10 country program, which was one of the first, not the first, but one of the first to actually look at bringing this technique to lower income countries and setting up national programs for Clubfoot so that um, that services could be provided in a coordinated and comprehensive way to try and meet, reach the most numbers of children possible. And um, the Ponsetti technique is, an, is absolutely so well suited to the lower income setting. Um, the results can be really good when it's done correctly. Um, and it also doesn't require a huge amount of resources. Um, so, you know, you need some, some under wrap for your, your plaster, you need plaster of Paris, you need a tenotomy set and you need braces and you need some trained skilled people to apply it and a club foot clinic. Um, and the difference between that and doing major surgery for club foot, which used to be done in the past, um, is enormous in terms of resources and the cost of it. Um, we think that children in low income countries can be treated for between 150 to 500 dollars per treatment for the whole treatment for a child so yeah it's absolutely amazing and if you if you ever travel to to one of these countries and you see people that haven't had treatment um, you'll realize that the cost of completely changing someone's life is um, is so low because the disability that's caused by clubfoot if it's not treated is really severe you see people crawling on their knees begging not able to walk properly and um, and really marginalized by society um, so yes, back to your original question. Since um, since 2007, we've been monitoring the spread of the Ponsetti technique and, and the setting up of these national programs and working really closely with our partners to try and encourage that process. Um, in two, 2005 is the earliest estimate that we have. Um, and at that time, we know of only a handful of, of national programs for clubfoot. Um, and we think that less than 1% of children born with clubfoot in low and middle income countries were receiving Ponsetti treatment. Um, and since then, over the last 10 years, so the last time we did this survey was in 2015, um, the number of countries offering Ponsetti treatment and the number of children accessing it has grown really exponentially. So in, in 2015, there were 55 countries that sent us data on um, on the services for children with clubfoot um, and those 55 contained 80% of all cases of children with clubfoot in low and middle income countries um, and we think that now as of 2017 probably around 15 to 20 percent of children born with clubfoot in low and middle income countries are are receiving Ponsetti treatment. So it's it's grown hugely in the last 10 years, um, but I'd say there's still a very long way to go um, in terms of getting those children into treatment and not just starting treatment, but seeing treatment through right until age four to five when they finish wearing the braces. Um, and at that point, they have a pretty good chance of going on living a normal life without having a relapse um, and being able to function um as well as they can that's amazing that's a that's a really nice increase in um the number of children that are being um effectively managed and um uh, and like you say there is still a long way to go um if we're up to 15 to 20 percent of children with club foot being being sort of treated um what are the what do you think the main challenges challenges are to to getting to reach that other um, 80 to 85 percent and I know you've addressed this already with the Africa club foot training resources and courses that you've developed um, is it is it just a case of getting out there to train people in effective management um, or what are the other sort of challenges that people could think about well tra training is a huge challenge and many many more health workers are needed um, and you know, for many of these countries, the bulk of those health workers are going to be physiotherapists that will be managing um, clubfoot treat, uh, club treatment. Um, 
so that is that is a huge challenge um another big challenge is that you can't only train people but you have to provide the materials and the facilities to be able to um, treat clubfoot. We often hear of um, children starting treatment and then the plaster runs out or there's not a brace available um, or they don't didn't know when to come back from their next bracing appointment. And those kind of things um, might seem small, but they can make the difference between a child completing treatment or not. Um, another really big challenge is that parents, the awareness about clubfoot is very low in society as a whole. Um, and so if a child is born with clubfoot, parents don't know that it's a treatable condition. It's often um, put down to being a curse or um, something that's caused by supernatural um, powers. So people think that it can't be treated. Um, and it's often only later on in life when they see how much it's affecting the child's function that they start to, um, to seek treatment. So raising awareness is really important. And then there's the issue of access as well. Um, we Actually, when we've calculated our estimates for the whole world, 91% um, of all children estimated to be born with clubfoot are in low and middle income countries, so in the most challenging environments. And um, what we hear time and again from parents is that actually getting to treatment is is a big challenge. Um, so it's the cost of transport, the time of transport. Many countries, um, the clinics are few and far between. Um, and then it's the challenge of having to go every week for casting for between, say, five and eight weeks. Um, and then to keep attending for regular follow ups to um, be given new braces. Um, so those are all those are all big challenges. And I think finally, I would just mention um, you know, funding as well is a, is a huge challenge. Um, we really need people to get behind um, this effort to bring treatment to to all the children of the world, um, because that and it's not only funding from outside, but it's also ministries of health that need to start um, taking this on and providing it through their national health systems. Yeah, and it sounds like. It sounds like access is a huge problem. And so is there a is there a place for setting up more clinics? Um, is it possible to have like really small clinics, um, more of them instead of large clinics dispersed around? Yeah, see, now that's a challenging one. Um, it is possible to have small clinics. But what we've found actually over time is that if you don't see enough patients, that sometimes the quality of treatment can can go down. Um, tr actually applying the Ponsetti treatment is quite a manual skill. Um, so it's something that you you need to be accustomed to doing regularly. Um, the other challenge with small clinics is just the supply chains of and the logistics of getting braces to a really small clinic. Um, but I think there needs to be a balance, a balance there. Um, one one surgeon that I know that works in Kenya, um, he says that you should treat a minimum of two cases a month or 24 cases a year in order to um, to keep your quality good. Um, and I don't know that that's backed up with any research, but he's he's a guy that oversees lots of clinics, so he has a pretty good idea, I think. Yeah, interesting. And one one other thing that I'm thinking about that I'm interested to know. Um, so we've talked about how um, the training resources you, you've developed have been to standardise treatment across the world. Um, is treatment or management of children with clubfoot the same in high income settings as in low income settings? It is. It's Yeah, pretty much exactly the same. So the job I do at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London um, is exactly the same as the way I'd be treating um, children in, for example, when I worked in Malawi. Um, so it's the it's the same, you apply plaster casts, um, then the tenotomy is generally done as an outpatient procedure in the clinic. Um, and then there's lots of different types of braces, um, but they all do essentially the same thing, which is to hold the feet in a position of abduction and slight dorsiflexion. Um, and there's some design principles that we'll, I think, be presenting later on in the course so that you can tell what is a good brace and what's maybe not a good brace. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's the same worldwide. Yeah. I mean, I find that really interesting. Um, I don't know why, because I guess tre- treating neck pain is the same worldwide. It's just different contexts, isn't it? But I think in this in this situation with children with clubfoot, it is exactly the same, and and it's a really nice. Um, and, and it is quite a small world, like you said at the beginning. Um, and it's really nice for anyone. It would be really nice for anyone that's working with children with clubfoot or on this course that we can have a big conversation across the world because everybody is kind of at the same level of understanding and the same level of knowledge and doing the same thing. But the, dif- the only difference is the context in which we're working and, you know, setting up the clinics and getting resources, like you say. So I think it's quite a unique um, condition that we as physiotherapists work with um, but also I wanted to mention that you know you physiotherapists are quite involved with these children but it's not just physiotherapists is it it's a it's a multidisciplinary team um, that, that gets involved so um, what are the um, healthcare practitioners are important to be on the team uh, it really varies around the world, actually, um, and I think it sort of depends on the local setup and who's available. Um, in the UK, a lot of the um, Ponsetti clinics are mainly the treatments mainly done by physiotherapists with the oversight of an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, and I would say that where orthopaedic surgeons are available, that they are a, a really essential um, part of the team as well to oversee the treatment, to provide the tenotomies, um, and also sometimes um, with older children or relapse cases um, to provide surgical in, input where it's needed. Um, in some countries, most of the treatment is done by orthopaedic surgeons. Um, in others, it's um, prosthetists and orthotists that do the casting and apply the braces. Um, in others, it's nurses and occupational therapists. Um, so I think all, all doing the same job, but um, it just depends who's who's available um, and, and, as I said, the local setup. And now in some countries... Um, they've actually found that clinics can get so busy um, that there just isn't time for the clinical staff to to talk to the families about the treatment. And um, actually, we found that the family having a relationship with the clinical staff is really, really important, especially when it comes to adhering with the bracing for the course of treatment. And, and that's that can be quite tough for families. So one thing that keeps them coming back is where they have a good relationship with the clinic staff. Um, And so some countries have now brought in um, parent advisors or counsellors into their clinics. um, And they're people that specifically have time to work with families, explain the whole treatment, keep reminding them about the braces. And they will also notice if the families don't come back when they're supposed to, and they'll give them a call and follow them up. Um, So some of the countries where they're really, really busy um, have found that to be a, a really useful adjunct as well to to the clinical treatment it sounds like that um that's a really nice way to sort of bring the big picture together to include the family and i and i kind of i can see how that helps um massively um um, using you know as healthcare professionals we all have that skill to communicate and to educate we should have and that's what we should be trying to do well and, and and that's a good way to do it with the parents and family as well and carers um so you've covered um you've actually summarized quite a lot there it with um in um everything that we're going to cover with this course and in managing children with clubfoot and and also it's really nice to hear from you who has a really good grasp on what's going on all around the world to hear the differences and the similarities around the world is there anything that um we haven't talked about that you think is important to share about the big sort of global clubfoot picture <laughs> Well, at, um, at Global Clubfoot Initiative, um, we, as I said, we've been monitoring progress over the last 10 years. Um, and it got to a point where it was like, well, this is this is really spreading. And actually um, looking at our partner organizations who are actually working in the field, um, you know, we've, we've got a really good idea of what we need to do now um, on a country by country level um, with setting up these national programs um, for Clubfoot. Um, And so 
we've actually worked together with our partner organizations to put together a global strategy for for Clubfoot called Run Free 2030. And that's looking at really scaling up what started to happen, um, scaling up that, you know, we're now reaching 15 um, percent of children in low and middle income countries, but we really want to reach all of them. And there's no reason why we shouldn't. Um, you know, the Ponsetti method can be applied um, by a physiotherapist or an other appropriately trained health professional. It's low resource. It can be um, spread throughout a country through a national program, which looks at putting clinics in strategic places across the country so that parents can reach them. Um, and yeah, it just it's time for us to really give it a big push and a big effort um, and to bring this life changing treatment into countries all over the world um, so that every child born with clubfoot can get the treatment that they need. So it sounds like a great, um, a great strategy or initiative. Um, how can people get involved in that? Um, well, by providing, I'd say for, for our listeners or, or viewers, um, by getting trained and providing treatment. Um, and oftentimes that will be working um, with within your, your local setup or working with a Ministry of Health. But I think if people see a need um, for something on a wider level, on a more national level, or maybe where more support is needed, um, then then they could let us know and we can put them in touch potentially with people that can help with that. Um, so that's that's the providing the treatment part. There's also raising awareness. Um, so, you know, whatever you can do within your clinics, whether it's just asking the parents or the families that of the children you treat to go and spread the word, that's one really effective way of raising awareness. Um, other times clinics have got in touch with their local radio station or their local media um, to, to do just short pieces explaining what Clubfoot is and what the treatment is and where it's available. Um, and I would just say we all need to work together. Um, so, you know, being aware of what's available in your country and building up those networks, um, not only for referrals and for patients, but also so that clinicians can support each other um, is really important. And that's something we've seen work really well, um, both here in the UK and in and in other countries as well. That's great. Um, and I'm so glad that we can make a contribution by um, helping, by all collaborating with you to deliver this course, um, just as a starting point for that um, and for further training. Um, so we've talked about GCI, um, the Global Clubfoot Initiative. Now, if you just search Global Clubfoot Initiative, we can find that online. And the same for the Af Africa Clubfoot Training. Um, that's easy to find online. Are there any other uh, resource, online resources or places that we can find out more that are particularly relevant that you'd like to share? Um, well, there's there's lots and lots of publications online, um, scientific publications, and um, we actually do a newsletter every quarter or so where we summarise the latest research that we think is the most relevant. So you can sign up for that on our website if you'd like to. Um, that's also a, way, a great way of, of um, staying in touch. There's the Global Help um, Ponsetti Manual, um, otherwise known as the Red Book, um, which which has been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times, I believe, um, and that and that summarizes um, Ponsetti treatment. Um, there's the Ponsetti International Association website, which has some great resources and also some good lists of where people can find treatment in different countries. Um, and then, of course, there's all the partners that we work with, um, and you can find a list of them on our website, and they will have country-specific information about the countries that they're working working in um, so lots of great resources out there yeah that's great thanks so much Roz it's been really nice to talk to you and to just get a really good overall sort of view of Clubfoot around the world and what everyone's up to and what we can all do to help um, it's been great to talk to you today so thank you for sharing all of that thank you Rachel and yeah just really excited about this course and um, and to see how, how we can make a difference globally as physiotherapists. Thank you. You're welcome.